Hi, I'm Steve D'Antonio, your advocate for a more enjoyable, less costly, and safer boat ownership experience. I'm excited to share with you the introduction to our new video online series that will walk you through various systems on boats, identifying areas that you should know more about, items that could potentially fail, how to prevent those failures, and how to deal with them once they occur. I hope you'll join us. Hello, uh, Steve D'Antonio here from Steve D'Antonio Marine Consulting with another one of our uh, onboard educational videos. Uh, we're going to talk about doing engine room inspections while underway uh, during this presentation. I'll walk through uh, a variety of areas that should be checked uh, using uh, primarily an infrared pyrometer um, as well as a multimeter. Um, We'll touch on each one of those uh, segments and uh, go into detail on, on each one of those areas. And uh, we're going to start off with, uh, with safety, though, uh, when working in the engine room. As you can notice, I'm wearing eye protection. A few years ago, I was doing an inspection in an engine room. And as I stepped out of the engine room door, uh, a large coolant hose failed and filled the engine room with uh, steam and uh, an atomized coolant and uh, at 200 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And, uh, and when that happened, it reminded me of just how dangerous a, a place the engine room can be and how vulnerable you are to injury, especially your eyes, obviously a very sensitive part of your body. So after that happened, I made it a point to wear uh, safety glasses whenever I'm uh, doing an inspection on a boat, wherever I am, but primarily in the engine room. Um, uh, eye protection is, is just so critical, I can't emphasize that enough. So just get into the habit of wearing eye protection after a while. I really don't think about wearing it. Uh, the version that I have has readers built into it uh, because I need a, a 1.5 uh, reader magnification. Uh, those are readily available online. Um, and you can get them that uh, they'll go over your existing uh, prescription glasses if you need that. Uh, so again, really important to wear eye protection. You'll also see that I have ear protection. Obviously these engines aren't running. We're not going to do this uh, underway because you wouldn't be able to hear me. Um, but when you're in the engine room and the engines are running, even if it's just for a minute, um, hearing damage is cumulative. So uh, every little bit that you can protect uh, is worth it. So, so I, I put these on even though I'm just going into the engine room for a minute uh, to protect my hearing and preserve uh, my hearing. Um, now you'll see I'm wearing the, this style that doesn't go over my head. Uh, primarily because I'm wearing them for long periods of time. I'm not just coming into the engine room for a few minutes and then leaving. I'm, I'm usually in here for much longer than that. Uh, and the, the over-the-head ones with the glasses uh, can sort of be uncomfortable, give you a headache after a while. So I like this style and I can have them with me all the time so I don't have to remember uh, to put them on as I'm going to the engine room and I can't misplace them. Once I get on the boat to do an inspection and, and a sea trial, I just put that style on and then, uh, and then I can pop them into my ears whenever I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to go into the engine room. Uh, if you look down here, you'll also notice that uh, I'm wearing shoes. I make it a point to always wear closed-toed shoes when I'm in an engine room. Uh, another quick uh, engine room sea story. Uh, a few years ago, I was doing an inspection in an engine room underway. I was wearing just socks and the engine room sole was uh, a gel coat uh, with, a, with a diamond pattern in it, but still quite slippery. And uh, I was moving around the engine room taking readings and I lost my footing and my foot slipped off of the, the decking material and uh, made contact with the coupling, the propeller shaft coupling, which was turning because the boat was underway. And that coupling had a set screw in it with a safety wire on the set screw, a seizing wire rather and a, a segment of that seizing wire was sticking out sort of like a fish hook and it, it caught my sock and, and cleanly yanked it right off my foot. Uh, I wasn't injured, but it, it, uh, it really got my attention and, uh, and, and from that moment onward, uh, I make it a point to wear uh, proper uh, shoes, you know, closed-toed shoes, not sandals, uh, uh, in, when I'm in the engine room, um, just uh, for footing purposes primarily um, and there's lots of areas where you could injure yourself, uh, you know, by stepping on something with bare feet, certainly. Uh, so uh, I, I strongly recommend uh, shoe uh, footwear, um, closed toe footwear, whenever you're working in the engine room uh, for all of those reasons. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's move around uh, the engine room a little bit. 
while we're doing this, uh, another um, uh, comment worthy of some attention is your attention. Uh, when you're in the engine room, it is, as I said, a potentially dangerous place. Uh, you've got to be on your game. You've got to be paying attention. If you're distracted, if you're tired, if you're looking at your phone, uh, the engine room is not the place to be. Again, lots of places to get hurt. Put your hand in the wrong place uh, or your foot um, and, and severe injury could result very quickly. Um, a few years ago, uh, a fellow that I worked with at a boatyard came in from outside from bright sunlight, came into an engine compartment that was fairly dark, wasn't really paying attention, stuck his hand into a belt <clears throat> and lost his thumb uh, permanently, sadly. Uh, for that reason. Uh, so you've got to pay attention uh, when you are working in an engine room. If you're coming in here to do an engine room check while you're underway, uh, before I open that engine room hatch, I just remind myself um, I've got to be paying attention. This is a dangerous place, so you should do the same. Uh, now, you'll notice um, I'm not wearing any clothing with tassels on it or uh, drawstrings. Uh, also something we don't want to do around machinery. Um, no rings on my hands. My watch band is plastic, so it doesn't conduct electricity. And if something catches this watch band, it'll just rip, rip it right off without hurting me. It's a, a relatively soft rubber band. Um, all of those things are important. No ponytails uh, that could get caught in machinery if you're hanging over something. Um, again, it's, it's a potentially dangerous place, so we, we've got to respect it. Uh, if we do, uh, then, then we can remain safe while we're in here and doing what we need to do. Okay, so what do we need to do and why do we need to do this? Engine room checks while underway, uh, very important. We want to be looking for things that could be uh, preparing or potentially failing before they actually fail. We're looking for leaks, we're looking for temperatures that aren't right, we're looking for fasteners that are loose. Uh, if you're underway um, and any of those things occur, it could uh, jeopardize the safety of the vessel or at least your ability to move. So if you can catch those early, it's worth doing. And so doing uh, routine engine room checks is important. People often ask me, you know, how often do I have to do it? It's really up to you. Um, a lot of boat owners will do this on an hourly basis. I don't think you can do them too often, so I would be perfectly fine with a once an hour engine room check. I would say at a minimum uh, every four hours to do an engine room check. Another question I get is, well, I've got engine room cameras. If I have that, do I need to do an engine room check? Well. You can't take infrared pyrometer readings all around the engine room with an infrared cam or with a camera. Maybe if you had an infrared camera, you'd get some indication of temperature, but not really uh, fine temperature measurements and, and not everywhere in the engine room. Um, and uh, lo while looking at the engine room, using a camera is extremely valuable. I, I advocate that. Uh, if you step into the engine room and there's a coolant leak or a fuel leak, you're probably going to smell that right away. Those are very distinct uh, odors, and that's something obviously you can't do with a camera. You, you wouldn't know that you had uh, a leak uh, based on the camera necessarily because you can't smell uh, clearly using just a camera. So for me, getting into the engine room uh, fairly often while you're underway is, a, is a, a good idea. It's very important. As I said, you can't do it often enough. Uh, once an hour is great, at least once every four hours uh, at, at a minimum uh, would be worth doing. To do your engine room uh, inspection, you need tools. Um, not a lot of them, fortunately, but you do need specific types of tools. Here I have uh, the primary tools that I use when I do my engine room underway inspections. I've got an infrared pyrometer and I have a multimeter. Um, the multimeter is somewhat optional for routine inspections depending on what um, type of sensing equipment you have. I'll get to that when I get to those specific areas. But the infrared pyrometer, absolutely critical uh, because that's, your, um, that, that's the main tool that you will use when you're doing uh, your engine room inspection. Other than your eyes and your, your ears and your nose and your sense of touch, um, this tool is, uh, is extremely important and valuable. Uh, when I do an engine room inspection, I try to start in the same place every time and work my way around the engine room so I'm not backtracking. So I make a, what I call a circumnavigation of the engine room, trying to hit all the areas that I need to get to. If it's your own boat, obviously, you can map that out so that you do it efficiently. Uh, and again, you're not moving back and forth through the engine room. The less time you have to spend in there underway, the better, obviously. Um, so, so be uh, sort of mindful about that. 
and do it the same way every time so it becomes a routine. If you do that, you're less likely to miss things. So I like to start with um, uh, the sort of uh, port forward area in the engine room um, and I'm, I'm looking for uh, a variety of things when I get there. So let's walk over to this port forward area. I'm looking at the engine here. Uh, this engine has a guard over the belt, which is good. It's safe. Um, but unfortunately, I can't see the belt, so I can't see what's going on with belts. So belt inspections in that case uh, for an engine like this that has a belt guard, and again, that's a good idea to have one, um, those have to be done static. When the boat is at rest, uh, removing the belt guard or looking behind it with a flashlight uh, for areas of, uh, of concern, and, uh, and I'll go into those in a minute. Um, what's the next thing I'm looking at is coolant, uh, the antifreeze. Um, most modern marine engines uh, have what's called a coolant recovery bottle. As it happens, this vessel does not. It's not mandatory, uh, but they are extremely valuable to have those. We'll link uh, an article um, in this video uh, to uh, um, uh, an article that covers uh, coolant recovery bottles and the value uh, that they have and the role that they play. Uh, but if you don't have a coolant recovery bottle, uh, then you can't see the level of the coolant in the cooling system. Obviously, you can't open the cap when it's hot, uh, so you don't know that. That's something that would have to be done when the engine's cold. Uh, but in this case, I can measure the temperature of the uh, expansion tank, uh, which is where the, the, the coolant uh, is, is, has its reservoir, uh, for lack of a better word. So in this case, on this engine, uh, coolant pressure cap here, uh, a coolant expansion tank here and I'm taking my infrared pyrometer and uh, waving it over this the side of this tank and looking for the highest reading. Now infrared pyrometers most of the ones that are available today um, will give you the ability to scan an area and record the highest reading of wherever you scanned while you're holding the trigger. That's an extremely valuable feature. I'd say it's mandatory because I don't want to have to be looking at it and remember the numbers the whole time that I'm squeezing the trigger and raising it. I'm looking for the highest number. So if I'm shooting the side of this tank, um, I'm going to see numbers, uh, you know, for the average engine somewhere between 165 and 195 degrees probably. Um, what's important about that is any changes. So uh, if your engine normally runs after it's warmed up and loaded at 185 degrees, and you come in and scan that tank and it's now at 200 or it's at 150, uh, you know that something's wrong and it's, uh, it's worth paying attention to. So again, the scanning feature, really important for uh, infrared pyrometers um, and a, uh, uh, a laser pointer like that one has. Again, most of them have this today. It would be hard to find one that doesn't. And you don't have to spend a lot of money for it. Actually, this is a backup infrared pyrometer. I lost mine not long ago and have a new one on the way. Um, the one that I use uses two infrared or two uh, LED uh, pointers that converge at a fixed distance, which I find helpful. Now, when you're using an infrared pyrometer, uh, there's a few things to keep in mind. One is the closer that you are to the object you're reading, the better. You cannot read something from across an engine room just because the uh, aiming dot is the size of an eraser doesn't mean that that's the surface area that it is reading. Uh, infrared pyrometers have a cone-shaped uh, measuring area so that the further you get from the surface you're measuring, the larger that area and the infrared pyrometer is averaging everything in there. So if I shoot an engine from here or an expansion tank, I might inadvertently be capturing something like exhaust components, which would be much hotter than the, the coolant potentially. You don't want to do that. So the closer you are uh, to the object you're measuring, the better. Um, and, and so I like to put my infrared pyrometer right up very close to that surface. If it's not something that'll damage or melt the infrared pyrometer, you can touch it. There's no harm in that. If it's an exhaust system, obviously, or something much hotter than that, uh, you don't want to touch it. But you can get very close to it to take your reading. Another thing to keep in mind is highly reflective surfaces uh, uh, tend to confuse infrared pyrometers. So something like this polished aluminum, if I was measuring that, I would probably get an inappropriately or incorrectly low number uh, because this uses light reflectivity or emissivity from the surface to determine the temperature of that surface. Uh, so if you have to measure something that is highly reflective, like chrome or polished stainless steel or polished aluminum, 
Uh, the exhaust systems on some engines use a, a highly reflective uh, insulating foil that can confuse the meter. Um, if you need to measure that surface, the thing to do is to uh, paint a small area with flat black paint. doesn't need to be very big, just large enough for this to read. Uh, a flat black surface is the most accurate for infrared pyrometer use. Uh, so again, if it's something like exhaust, uh, anything that's, uh, that's polished, uh, stainless steel, aluminum, um, or chrome, uh, that you do need to read, um, just keep that in mind, that if it's reflective, it's probably not going to work well. Another area that we're looking at is electrical, so the alternator. Um, <clears throat> alternator temperature is critical. Alternators that work really hard, a high output alternator on a vessel that might have a, an inverter system that's being used underway, uh, or charging a large battery bank um, potentially could get quite hot and you want to keep an eye on that. Usually the, uh, the hottest part of the alternator is going to be the stator area, so here. Um, and uh, we want to make sure we get that with our infrared pyrometer. Again, we can, we can wave it over the whole alternator. Be careful not to shoot the engine block because that's going to give you a, a reading you're not interested in. But you can wave it around the alternator like this and, uh, and get your highest reading. Um, people ask me sometimes, uh, you know, should I be measuring the voltage on the alternator? Um, well, most boats will do that for you uh, without you having to use any tools. You have an instrument panel that should be measuring the, uh, the voltage that is on the engine starting battery, which is what that alternator is supplying, or if it's a high output alternator that's supplying just a house bank, uh, which is not uncommon, uh, then um, you would be uh, reading the voltage on that with a voltmeter on your panel. Uh, so is there any value in, in measuring voltage on the alternator? Probably not, in my opinion. I don't think you need to do that with a, a multimeter unless you thought something was wrong. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the output on the alternator can be affected by other charging sources. So if while you're underway you've got a generator running and that generator is powering a battery charger or an inverter charger that is in charge mode, the alternator often will sense that voltage and stop putting out, stop charging, because it doesn't need to. It's, it's voltage sensitive. Uh, so in that case, if you did measure voltage at the alternator, you'd actually be measuring the charge voltage from the other charge source, which wouldn't really be very valuable to you. Um, if you want to measure alternator output, uh, then the way to do that is to use a multimeter with, a, with an inductive amp clamp like this that you can clamp around the wire and then read on the instrumentation on the amps uh, DC scale. Um, that will tell you alternator output regardless of what the voltage reading is. If another charge source is supplying voltage to that battery that the alternator is charging, uh, you would see no, little or no amps here and you'd know either the alternator is not working or that other charge source is carrying the load. So what do you do in that case? Um, turn the other charge source off. At least do that periodically test the output from the alternator with an amp clamp uh, so that you know that alternator is actually working. It's not uncommon at all for me to do an engine room inspection, a sea trial on a boat, and measure zero output on the alternator even with the generators not running uh, because it's the type of boat that um, the owner starts the generator and then starts the main engine has the generator running all the time. That will mask a malfunctioning alternator. If the generator fails, now you find yourself in a, in a situation where you need that alternator to be supplying voltage. It, won't, it may not be working. So you want to know that. So I'm not suggesting that you do that test on every engine room inspection. You certainly could, but I don't think you have to. But periodically, monthly, uh, check the, the current output uh, on uh, your alternator or alternators uh, with an inductive amp clamp with no other charge sources present. So not plugged into shore power, no generators running, just the alternators supplying power. Um, important to be able to do that. All right. Let's look at uh, belts. Um, now I mentioned if the, uh, if the engine has a belt guard, that's hard to do, but uh, often there are places where you can at least see part of the belt while the engine's running. Of course, you want to keep your hands uh, away from that. Uh, you need a good flashlight for engine room inspections. Um, I use a, uh, a light like this, it's a stream light, um, because primarily I can keep it on me at all times. In fact, I never leave home without 
my stream light, flashlight, and my, uh, my rigging knife. Um, I recommend that for all boat owners. Um, I recommend it for everybody uh, to carry a flashlight and, and a knife, at least where you're able or allowed to do that. Um, the flashlight is, is really invaluable for an engine room inspection because uh, clearly there will be spaces where you can't see things without it. So don't go into the engine room without your flashlight. So for the belt, we're looking in here. And what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for evidence of dust, belt dust, which is a black, very, very fine dust, uh, sort of powder-like consistency dust, uh, which, which will often occur if a belt is misaligned uh, with a pulley, uh, or if a self-tensioning device is wearing out and sort of turning a little bit sideways, the edge of the belt will wear against that pulley and create this dust. Um, so this engine, I'm happy to say, is generating none of that. It's absolutely spotless in there, so kudos to the owner of this boat uh, for taking good care of his engine. And why is that important uh, to keep that area clean? Well, if it does begin to fail, you're not going to know it if it's already dirty. So um, and cleanliness is, is not just cosmetic in an engine room. It's important to keep the entire area clean because there's a good, uh, it, it's a good way to know if something is changing if you see dirt or dust or oil or coolant or something uh, being generated. If the space is dirty, that's going to be hard to notice. So for belts in particular, that's really important. So I'm looking in there. This is the tensioning device on this engine right here. It has a large spring in it and a pulley that keeps that belt tight. And everything in there looks good and clean. And I can see part of the belt and I don't see any wear on it. I don't see any cracking. Uh, obviously, you can't look at that while the engine's running. That's a static inspection on the belt. Um, when the engine isn't running, you can look for damage to the belt. You can look for cracks in the surface of the belt, again, with your flashlight. Um, and you're looking for exposed filament. The filament is the white thread that is in the center of a serpentine-type belt. Um, and if the belt is misaligned, or if a pulley is misaligned, or if a tensioning device is wearing, that filament is going to become exposed and uh, you'll see a, a white sort of fluffy thread start to be exposed on the edge of the belt. Uh, so again, you can only see that when the engine's not running, obviously um, worth looking at um, um, at those times when the engine isn't running. We'll include an article uh, that covers uh, belts and what to look for, uh, a link to it um, in this video, um, among other things that are related to the engine room inspection. We have a whole article on that subject that goes into detail about each item and links to articles that cover each one of the areas that, that I'm going to talk about here. Um, okay, next area that we're going to look at is uh, exhaust systems. We need our infrared pyrometer again for that. Um, so what are we looking at for exhaust? Well, on most boats we've got a combination of wet and dry exhaust. Uh, so the dry portion of the exhaust in this case is this riser. It's got this black fiberglass type, uh, what they call a hard coat insulation on it. Um, so we're going to measure the temperature on that. We're going to measure the temperature on the wet portion of the exhaust, which is the first hose that you come to on the exhaust that is between the engine uh, exhaust system and the, and the vessel, uh, for lack of a better description. Um, and we're going to look, uh, importantly, and this is an area that's frequently overlooked, at the interface between the engine and the uh, dry exhaust. In this case, we'd call this a riser because it is uh, elevating the exhaust above the waterline. That interface is really important because frequently it has no insulation on it and violates the standards that we follow, the voluntary American Boat and Yacht Council standards that dictate that no portion of an engine uh, that you can touch should exceed 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if it does, it needs to be insulated or it needs a guard over it. If it's this area between uh, the turbocharger or the exhaust manifold and the exhaust riser and it has no insulation on it, it could easily be anywhere between four and 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Very, uh, um, very hot, obviously, and, and something that could injure you, burn you immediately, as well as be a fire hazard if something fell onto the engine uh, with those kinds of temperatures. So on this engine, uh, if you look here, you can see that there is this uh, insulation that is covering this uh, exhaust pipe between the turbocharger and the exhaust riser. This um, uh, silver colored material here is providing the insulation that's needed. So 
with our infrared pyrometer, we're measuring this, doing a, a wave over this whole riser, looking for our highest temperature. And we're putting it close to this, but probably not touching it again, because it might be hotter than uh, the infrared pyrometer is capable of enduring. Um, now, in this case, this is really reflective, so it's probably not going to give us an accurate reading. So what we're going to do, uh, what I would recommend, is painting a section of that with a high temperature flat black paint. You can get uh, flat black paint that's designed for exhaust systems and headers on automobiles. Paint a small section of that and use that as your temperature uh, measurement area. Um, on the wet exhaust, um, in this case we've got a, a blue silicone hose uh, that is uh, connecting the riser to the rest of the exhaust system that's attached to the vessel. That silicone hose does two things. It, it contains the exhaust, uh, the water and the gases that are in the exhaust that are now cool because water has been injected into them and it's isolating vibration from the engine uh, and the vessel or between the two. Uh, that hose in particular is especially good at that because it's silicone so it's very soft or supple and it has those ridges or humps in it uh, that act sort of like a spring and further isolate engine vibration from the vessel. I, I recommend uh, silicone hose be used in that application in particular and that style of hose in particular for exactly that reason. So what are we measuring there? Um, I'm taking my infrared pyrometer and I'm waving it over that part of the hose just looking for our highest temperature. It should be comparatively cool now. Uh, so if the exhaust gases that are coming out of this engine are anywhere between 400 and 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, this should be under 200 definitely because it's insulated that hose, now that we've got water injected into it, should be much cooler, somewhere in the region of uh, between 125 and 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you look at that hose carefully, you'll see there's a wire attached to it. This band and this wire, um, that is a temperature sensor that is used as part of a uh, exhaust temperature alarm system. Um, that is also an invaluable component and a requirement for compliance with ABYC standards because if the engine loses cooling water for the exhaust, not necessarily for the engine, but if the exhaust system loses cooling water because those gases are so hot, it's going to cause damage to those rubber and fiberglass components almost immediately, potentially a fire. Uh, at the very least, it's going to cause flooding and a soot-filled engine room, so a lot of damage, a lot of heartache for an owner if that happens. Um, with an exhaust temperature alarm, the moment that cooling water is lost, let's say within 30 seconds typically in my experience, that alarm is going to go off. It's going to tell the operator of the vessel the exhaust system is overheating. He or she can shut the engine down right away, typically avoid any damage. Uh, if the engine loses cooling water, um, and, and thus the exhaust system also loses cooling water, that alarm will go off long before the engine ever begins to overheat, so no damage to the engine, no damage to the exhaust system. I've had cases where owners have uh, turned off a seacock in order to check a strainer, clean the strainer out, forget to open the seacock, start the engine, within 30 seconds the alarm goes off, they shut the engine down, investigate, realize they've left the uh, seacock closed, um, check the, sh the impeller, no damage. And that's how quickly that alarm can go off. So it can, it can, uh, it can save you a lot of uh, heartache, again, and uh, financial impact and, and potentially a fire uh, if the exhaust system overheated and caught fire. So uh, while that's not part of your engine room inspection specifically, you are measuring the temperature on the wet and dry exhaust. Uh, but if you don't have an exhaust temperature alarm, um, I, I highly recommend that you get one, and again, that is an ABYC uh, compliance issue. One of the temperature features that we want to monitor in an engine room is the, the delta or difference between the air that's being drawn into the engine and the air that's outside the vessel that's being brought into the engine room. Um, the way that, that I prefer to do that is by using a, a digital thermometer, not an infrared pyrometer, because we don't really want to know the temperature of this actual air filter material or the, uh, the guard that's over it, this mesh material. I want to know the temperature of the air that is going into that filter. So I can do that in, uh, in one of two ways. I can use, again, this style of uh, thermometer that I can just 
tape or, or wire tie to this air filter, uh, not touching anything, but just near uh, the filter where the air is being drawn over it uh, so that I'm measuring that air temperature. Uh, when I'm doing a vessel inspection, I'll set up a couple of thermometers like this with a probe so that I can remotely mount this someplace where I can more easily see it. So I can put the probe there and have the display someplace else. Um, you can set one of these up and leave it there all the time if you choose to. There's no reason not to do that. It uses a little uh, coin style battery that lasts a very long time. Um, these are pretty accurate and they're pretty rugged. They're really designed to be used in fish tanks. Uh, so um, they, they hold up quite well in an engine room. Then you need a temperature measurement outside the vessel. Um, typically that would be in the shade somewhere outside the vessel. Um, it could be anywhere on the outside of the vessel provided it is uh, uh, air that is similar to the air that's being brought into the engine room through air intake. So you wouldn't want to put it in an enclosure, for instance, on a flybridge. That might be hotter in the sun. Uh, you want to have it outside in free-moving air, uh, not very far from the air intakes, again, in the shade. Um, what we're looking for typically, and this, this varies from engine manufacturer to engine manufacturer, and we'll include an article on this subject as well in the, in the links, um, what we're looking for is, again, the difference between outside air temperature and the temperature of the air going into the air filter, not just anywhere in the engine room, because the temperature up on the overhead obviously is going to be much higher than down in the bilge, and you could probably find 20 different temperatures around the engine room with your infrared pyrometer. What, what I'm really concerned about is what is the temperature of the air being drawn into the engine, because engine manufacturers have a specified allowable delta between that and outside air temperature, and in many cases, a maximum uh, that they want to see. Uh, so uh, in some cases, it's as uh, low as 17 or 18 degrees. In other cases, it's as high as 30 degrees Fahrenheit in both cases for the difference. Uh, so if you measured 70 degrees at the air intake um, and it was uh, 60 degrees outside, that's a you know, very acceptable delta. Uh, if the outside air temperature was 70 and the inside air temperature at the air intake was 110, that's probably too hot. So check for your engine manufacturer to see what their allowable delta is. Uh, again, there's some details about this in the link, uh, the article on this subject that we'll include. Um, but it's, it's, it's very much worth tracking this because and measuring it initially because not only is it an issue for the engine, uh, if the engine air is too, the air going into the engine is too hot, it reduces the efficiency and the fuel economy of the engine, but a hot engine room is hard on everything in this space. It's hard on electrical components, it's hard on electronic components, it's hard on hoses and belts and other uh, insulation, soft goods. Um, so the cooler the engine room is, always the better. Um, and this is a, sort of a, a, a barometer of that measurement that we want to keep track of and again initially measure to make sure that the, the vessel is within the specifications established by the engine manufacturer but also because we want to keep that engine room uh, relatively cool. Um, again, relatively. We walk into the engine room and it's 80 degrees in here um, but it's 100 degrees outside. Uh, that's, you know, again, uh, that, that's, a, that's uh, something we can't change. We can't avoid that. Or, sorry, um, uh, reverse those two numbers. If it's 100 in the engine room and 80 degrees outside, the engine room is going to be hotter. We're accepting that, um, but we don't want it to be too hot. Um, that, that's really the concern.